You are listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. I'm Johanna. And I'm Annie. Thanks for joining us for part two of the Coronado Mansion deaths, the mysterious death of Rebecca Zahau. And that's what we're looking at today is the details of the death of Rebecca. Can we do a quick recap, please? Yes, absolutely. Please, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, please go back and listen to that first. But if you did listen and you just need a refresher, Rebecca Zahau was watching her boyfriend, Jonah's son, Max, when unfortunately Max suffered a catastrophic fall from the second floor and uh, was rushed to the hospital. A few days later, as Max is clinging to life at the hospital, Jonah's brother, Adam, who has flown in to support his brother, finds Rebecca hanging from a second story balcony. She is nude with her hands bound behind her back and her feet are also bound. When Adam found her, she also had a long sleeve t-shirt around her neck with the sleeves knotted and stuffed into her mouth uh, as a gag. So now we're talking about what else is found at the scene. And the first is being that infamous door painted with the words, she saved him. Can you save her? Is that supposed to be the suicide note? Yeah, apparently. Initially, there were images that the police had and they had redacted, like they kind of looked like white out over the message because they were talking about this cryptic suicide note that she left. That's what they were calling it, a suicide note. But when you look at the pictures I sent you and you look at that photo and remember that Rebecca was an artist. Okay, I'm looking at it. The painting on the door is very crude. And all I can think of is red rum. So. <gasps> oh, yes. Sorry, but that ain't no suicide note. That's a fucking riddle. And if that's supposed to be her suicide note, then why wouldn't it say, I saved him, can you save me? Yeah, I know. It's super disturbing. I also did not make the red rum connection (laughs) until you just mentioned it. But eventually, the police stopped calling it her suicide note. But can you imagine if you're Rebecca's sister and you're told that she killed herself and left a note and then that's the note and then you find out about how she was found? I understand completely why her family are so adamant that it was a murder. Yeah, I also want to note that Jonah didn't believe it was a suicide when he saw the situation for himself either and I think he hired some uh, investigators of his own. One of the programs I watched compared Rebecca and Adam's writing to the writing on the door, and they concluded that Adam's writing was a lot more similar to the writing on the door. But honestly, I think we have to take that foot with a grain of salt. We just don't know for sure. And I think they need a lot more handwriting samples to be more certain. Plus, writing with a what is it even written with a a brush a super thick marker anyway writing with a brush is really difficult and if you're not used to it especially so it might be really hard to make a conclusive comparison yeah that's true so yeah it's black paint and it was written with a paintbrush a small like artist paintbrush rebecca did paint as a hobby and she signed her paintings i don't know you'd think if it was her writing that it would be neater but the next thing they're going to notice was blood there are several blood drops found on the carpet around the area of the door where the message is written along with a crumpled towel we do know that rebecca was menstruating when she died and so it's believed that uh, her period was the reason for those drops of blood Remember she was found tied and hanged with sections of a reddish-orange ski rope. They did determine that came from the garage, and in the room that she had done this was an office-slash-guest room that opens out onto a balcony. And in that room, they found the other end of the rope tied to a leg of the bed with a slipknot. This is the room with the door you know, message. On the floor near the bed is a dog toy, a plastic garbage bag that looks empty, a couple of paintbrushes, one that has black paint on it, so that's presumably what was used to write the message, a large kitchen knife, and a small serrated kitchen knife. And then under the plastic bag was a tube of black paint. They also took computers from the house. I don't know where exactly they took them, and there's some debate about what they found. So This is something you hear on almost everything that you read or listen to about this case, that people say that specifically Asian bondage porn was found on these computers. I'm not getting into detail because everything I've read is very conflicting and it's hard to understand what the truth is. I believe the police 
had said that this was found on her computer the day before the hanging. Was she looking at it as a way to stage her suicide and make it look like a murder herself? Or did someone murder her and then look at bondage porn for inspiration? I honestly don't know, and I went down so many Reddit and web sleuth rabbit holes. Can I just tell you, don't Google Asian bondage porn. Because <laughs> I, I think I Googled, like, how computer is Asian bondage porn. Porn. And of course, that age in bondage porn. So yeah, that's I should have known better. Honestly, if you're out there, you're listening to this, if you know conclusively what the deal is with the computers, please let me know. The Reddit rabbit holes uh, been there, not recommendable. Yeah, there is actually one incredible Reddit write up about this case and I'm going to link to it in my sources because this one guy I think his name is Glitter Cheese or Cheese Glitter but he spent I'm not even sure that's the right username but he wrote like a four part thing on the case and it was actually super helpful to just keep the timeline straight as I was going through so thanks thanks Reddit for that thanks Glitter so, Cheese Yes, thank you. So also in the bedroom, there was an overturned chair on the floor. And then when they walked out onto the balcony, footprints were found on the balcony, which is tiled. It's kind of tiled in like a herringbone pattern of what looked like sort of brick covered ceramic tile. It's also really dirty. The, the balcony. So it really could have used a swiffering. Police found what they identified to be Rebecca's heel impressions in the dirt for her right and left foot. And then you can see a mark that they said was the ball of her right foot. But then on the left is a boot print. And they determined that was made by one of the first responders on this scene. Okay, so the police didn't really preserve the scene? I mean, I would say there were some issues. They also find some blood drops in the master bathroom shower, as well as what's described as a clump of hair. Now, I really think that that last one sounds more ominous than it was because she had long hair. And when you have long hair, you'll often end up collecting your hair in your hands as you wash and condition, leaving you with a big old hairball that you hopefully then remember to toss when you get out of the shower. But we all forget and find a hairball every once in a while. Yeah, big balls of hair is normal when you have long hair. I used to like glue it to the to the side of the shower and then take it out. But sometimes you forget that's true. That's I had true. really long hair like that onto my waist and when I had my hair cut from my waist length to a bob it was such a relief yeah 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 so you can see why I've pretty much dismissed the clump of hair as just hair they also talk to the neighbors and one of the neighbors reports that she heard a woman screaming help me I've seen her or heard her <laughs> original recorded statement that was made on the 13th and she says that she heard someone screaming and yelling help around 11:30. but the police report stated it was likely just to be teenagers playing around on the beach okay how would they know did Did they find teenagers? Do you think it was teenagers? I don't know. I've seen a few interviews with the woman who reported hearing the screams, and she seems credible, but she definitely, I mean, I think she definitely believes that she knows the difference between kids on the beach and a woman screaming for help. I grew up on the beach, and sound really does carry, though, when you're on the water. So I don't know. I think I'd be able to tell the difference. But we also know that this kind of witness account is really unreliable. I'm still not sure I'd have dismissed it all so quickly. But the problem with this from a she was murdered perspective is that the medical examiner ruled her time of death to be between 1 and 3 a.m., probably closer to 3 a.m. So screaming wouldn't necessarily make sense at that time. If you believe that Adam also learned that Max wouldn't make it and that's why he killed her, then nobody had that information until almost 1 in the morning, but the screams were heard at 11.30. But then it's also possible someone other than Adam killed her. It's possible, but were there any other witness accounts? Yes. Someone reported a woman acting strangely in front of the house. So she was pacing by the front door and then walking down the driveway. But I think ultimately they were able to determine that that was Nina when she had walked over and tried to talk to Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah, that could be and actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, what else was found in the house? In the guest house, they found a pair of women's underwear in a trash can. They were believed to be left over after a slumber party that Jonah's daughter had before she flew back to Arizona, so they were just not collected or tested. They also dusted for fingerprints and swabbed everything for DNA. You asked earlier if there were problems with the investigation. The San Diego medical examiner, Dr. Jonathan Lucas, finally arrived at 7.14 p.m., over 12 hours after Adam called 911. During this time, 
There were media helicopters flying all over the scene. Neighbors were letting photographers onto their balconies where they could see her naked body lying in the courtyard. And a lot of people were very, very upset about this. She was lying exposed for over 12 hours. And so this is why a lot of people feel the investigation was just very badly handled. They left her body out there exposed for 12 hours. Yeah. Yep. It's completely inexcusable. I mean, there are literally tents for this specific need. And it's not like it's a poor county. Do you know what I mean? It's not like this happened in some place where you yeah. really understand if they didn't have yeah. resources. Like this is, come on. I mean, I think homes in this area start at a million. So it's yeah. like, come on. Very sadly, Max Shackney did pass away on July 16th. His parents donated his organs, and he was able to save the lives of three other children. It's the only good thing to have come from this tragedy. And I guess we will never know the truth about what happened there. I mean, how could we? But what did they say happened to Rebecca? Okay, let's talk about the autopsy findings. I will post a link to the full autopsy report if you want to read it, but hopefully I'll be able to just cover the important bits here. Rebecca was a healthy 32-year-old woman who weighed 100 pounds. She was bound with her hands behind her back. Her feet were similarly bound, and her feet were dirty. The medical examiner noted that Rebecca's right hand was easily removed from the bindings if she had tied her hands in front of her, slipped the hand through the rope, and then moved her hands behind her back, slipped her other hand in the bindings, and then tightened it. I was just about to say that, looking at the photo, the way the hands are tied, that's not tied at all. It's possible to do that by yourself, but then again, why would you? So apparently, this is the thing. It's not unheard of in hanging suicides. People will tie their hands to try to prevent themselves from saving their lives. Had she ever attempted suicide before? There's no record of it, and that's the odd thing, right? I mean, I'm admittedly speculating here, but I could see if you had attempted suicide and failed in the past, then you would be maybe getting better at it, trying to ensure you succeeded. But she hadn't tried before, as far as anyone knew, and she wasn't taking any medication that could have caused a suicidal reaction. But then, on the other hand... I mean, caused by the accident and the guilt she probably felt, she was under extreme distress and in kind of an emotional emergency situation. We can't compare this to suicides caused by other reasons, to be fair. That's true. That's true. So they also found black paint on her right hand, left breast, right nipple, right upper chest, right upper index finger, and on her neck. There was also some paint on the rope, I believe. They also found what appeared to be tape residue on her legs. Dr. Lucas stated that he believed Rebecca's injuries were consistent with a long drop hanging, which this means a drop of over six feet from the Spreckles Mansion balcony, which was measured to be nine feet, two inches. Dr. Lucas also noted petechial hemorrhages. Those are little broken blood vessels around the eyes and the mouth. They uh, happen often in deaths caused by hanging, suffocation, strangulation, and Positional asphyxiation. I get them sometimes on my arms and legs. People with autoimmune diseases get petechia too. It's um, just little, little red-purple bumps, but here the cause would be strangulation. Dr. Lucas noted an atypical ligature furrow around Rebecca's neck and also noted that the left arm of the hyoid bone and the left thyroid cartilage and left cricoid cartilage had been broken. His report says the uneven damage to the cartilage and the atypical ligature mark suggested that Rebecca may not have gone straight over the balcony, but may have fallen sideways, sort of like rolling off the edge at an angle. Dr. Lucas also reported that there was hemorrhaging of the muscles on the left side of her neck and now I've, I've written this down but I don't know if I can pronounce it right the sternocleidomastoid muscles and those are the muscles that run down either side of your neck so there was damage basically there was damage to the front and the sides of her neck muscles other autopsy findings were several minor bruises and scrapes on her back arms and legs like we said before he doesn't think Rebecca went straight over the balcony but rather she kind of like fell at an angle and then she came into contact with it looks like a cactus under there. I don't know if you got the looked at the pictures I sent you yet, but mm -hmm. it, there's like a little tree and then like some kind of big old cactus looking 
thing. She also had four marks on her scalp, which he also said as a result of her hitting the plants or possibly the balcony when she fell. Okay, that part uh, irritates me a bit. <laughs> which part? <laughs> <laughs> All of it. Okay, now, I have to imagine doing this, you know, tying a rope around the leg of the bed, putting it around your neck. After you undress, obviously, going out on the balcony, tie your feet, tie your arms behind your back. Do I jump then and cause this the going down at an ankle? Because I don't think that's the way one would do it. It seems unnecessary, difficult. So I imagine you go out on the balcony, sit on the railing, tie your feet, put the noose around your neck, maybe tie your arms and then fall straight forward with your feet first. You know what I mean? Do that make sense? Oh, yeah, that does make sense. That does make sense. But the marks in the dirt on the balcony just show that there would only have been like two little bunny hops with her bound feet. There was also the balcony, I think the height. I just wonder, she was little. She was only, what did I say, 5'3 or 5'4? Mm -hmm. So it would have been hard, but she was very strong. I mean, when you see pictures of her, like she is very thin, but like defined muscles. She's very athletic, yeah. But then with her hands tied behind her back, how does she get? It just seems... It just seems so strange. Yeah, so she would have had to work out the length of the rope she needed, you know, because if it was too long, she'd have just hit the ground, yeah. which might not kill her. So she would have had to figure out the length of rope she needed, tie the noose, wrap the shirt around her neck, and stuff the sleeves into her mouth, acting as a gag, and then tied up her own feet, tied her hands in front, re-secured them behind her, and then sort of shuffled or hopped out to the balcony, and then would she just kind of, like, launch herself over the edge? I don't know. But why gag yourself, though? It seems so pointless when you're about to throw yourself from a balcony with a noose around your neck. I don't think she could have been making a lot of noise. The fall is too short to really scream. I don't know. It, it just feels off. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I can imagine is if she was afraid that she would scream and someone would find her you know, in time to save her. But I agree, this isn't just another really strange aspect. And I also wonder who the long sleeve shirt belonged to and was there any significance to it? But there was also an overturned chair in the room. Yeah, but why didn't she put the chair on the balcony, step on the chair and then over the railing? That's it. I mean, that's exactly the problem. Every time there's a piece of evidence in this case that indicates one thing, there's something else that kind of contradicts it. Did she take something or drink something that night, you know, that would have made her behave irrationally, maybe? No, toxicology reports showed no drugs and no alcohol in her system. And that's no surprise. Like we were just saying, she was incredibly fit. I read one report that said that she just one day randomly ran a marathon with no training. <laughs> it was no problem. But when you see photos of her, like I believe that she could have run a marathon, no problem. I mean, problem. that's like Barney Stinson said, no, you, you, how to train for a marathon. You don't, you just run it. <laughs> you just run it. Yeah, that's my husband. Well, my husband trained for like six months. Yeah, this lady, she has no French fries in her diet. It, and it shows. Her time of death was estimated to be 3 a.m. on July 13th, 2011. Based on that autopsy, Dr. Lucas determined that Rebecca was alive when she went over the balcony. On September 2nd, 2011, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department finally announced their findings, and they found that Rebecca Zahau committed suicide. And people are shocked. Yeah, understandably. I'm shocked. I know. I know. So Jonah Shacknai released a statement that day. It's worth noting that he also hadn't believed it was a suicide and he had also hired some investigators. So Jonah's statement reads, quote, while the investigation is over, the emptiness and sadness in our hearts will remain forever. Max was an extraordinarily loving, happy, talented, and special little boy. He brought joy to everyone who knew him, and we will miss him desperately. Rebecca, too, was a wonderful and unique person who will always have a special place in my heart. Nothing will ever be the same for our families after these losses. But with today's information providing some much-needed answers, we will try to rebuild our lives and honor the memories we carry with us. Thank you for respecting our privacy as we struggle forward. End quote. I also want to mention that uh, Jonah, of course, did go to Missouri to attend Becca's funeral services. When he got home, it looks like he did get Ocean back home with him. Can yeah. you imagine this poor man, what he has gone through? It's awful. Like losing two of the people he loved most in his life. 
yeah. in such a short amount of time under such circumstances. It's it's horrible. Yeah, because losing a loved one is always difficult. But when it's an accident, when it's sudden and unexpected, it's much, much worse. And yeah, because so, it doesn't make sense. You, yeah. You're trying to make sense of things that don't make sense at all. Exactly, exactly. And so now he's had, you know, twice within a few days. It's just, my heart just breaks for him, really. But how did he decide it was a suicide? So detectives said that the red rope tied around Rebecca's neck was attached to the bed inside the home and the foot and toe impressions found on the balcony were hers. Her print was the only one found on the bed near where that rope was attached. They say that the evidence showed Rebecca leaned over the railing and then fell to her death. And they could tell this because the railing dust was disturbed in a way that was consistent with Rebecca's teeny tiny body. They also said the toe impressions on the balcony were consistent with a person leaning up over the railing. Like, you know, initially they could see her heels, but then only her toe. So like she had gone up on tiptoes, leaned over the railing and gone over. Authorities found no evidence of foul play. They said that the house fingerprints and DNA were the only ones found on the rope and the knife used to cut the rope into the different strips. They also found some personal journal entries that they believed indicated that she was depressed, but I've read a lot of them and I wouldn't say that they were evidence of her being depressed. You know, it's more things like, I wonder if Jonah and I will ever get married or, you know, I wish his kids weren't so his older kids, you know, we had a better relationship, that kind of thing. And I don't think it's anything that seems depressed. I think it's like normal journal venting. Jonathan Lucas, again, he's the doctor, uh, the medical examiner. He said that he was the first one to admit that this was a really unique and unusual case. Investigators released a video showing this woman how they could bind their own hands without assistance. And so no surprise, the media is all over this. TV programs are doing their own reenactments. The most infamous test, I think, is one where they used a hundred pound like punching bag and a bed that they put weights on to simulate the weight of the bed that the rope was tied to in Rebecca's case. And in their demonstration, the bed moved way more than the bed Rebecca's noose was attached to moved. But the police explanation was, of course, that thick wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I mean, makes sense. It does, absolutely. Meanwhile, as you would expect, Rebecca's family are absolutely positive she did not take her own life. And after the death is ruled a suicide, they get Anne Bremner involved. She's a high-profile attorney, and uh, she agrees to take the case pro bono. She's got connections, including Dr. Cyril Wecht. He's a renowned forensic pathologist who worked on the JFK assassination. I think he's just turned 80. I could be wrong about that. But he's also an attorney and an expert witness in trials all over the world, and he's absolutely an expert in forensic pathology. And he's, you know, he's an older man, but he's, it's all there. So attorney Bremner, Dr. Wecht, and uh, Rebecca's sister Mary and Mary's husband Doug, they appeared on a special two-part episode of the Dr. Phil show in November of 2011 to discuss Rebecca's death. I've only seen little snippets of this. I'm honestly not. I'm not a fan of Phil, but the Dr. Phil show did pay for the exhumation of Rebecca's body and for a second autopsy. So four months after Rebecca's death, Rebecca's body was exhumed and a second autopsy was performed by Dr. Cyril Wecht. A complete second autopsy couldn't be done because she had been embalmed. I mean, that's a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario right there. But what Dr. Wecht did find were a lot of issues with many of the findings of Dr. Lucas, who performed the original autopsy. And like what? Okay, so Dr. Wecht and Dr. Lucas both agree that there is significant damage to the internal structures of Rebecca's neck, including fractures of the hyoid and cricoid cartilage, as well as severely torn muscles in the front and on the sides of her neck. But Dr. Wecht says it's impossible to tell if Rebecca had been strangled prior to going over the balcony railing. The autopsy findings regarding Rebecca's neck injury are consistent with hanging, but they're not exclusive to hanging. So they could also be consistent with strangulation as the cause of death. Wecht also said that he was puzzled as to why Zaha's neck was not broken by the force of her fall from a balcony and why the, all the damage was on the front and sides of her neck, but none in the back, right? So like if someone's holding you down and 
They've got their hands around your neck. Where's all the damage going to be? Paul Holes appears on the Oxygen Show. If you don't know Paul Holes, he led the cold case team that identified and arrested the Golden State Killer. He knows Billy Jensen as well because Jensen worked with Michelle McNamara on her book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is all about the search for the Golden State Killer. So anyway, Paul Holes appears on this program and he brings up this long drop hanging issue. And he says that they're actually really rare in this country. We don't see them in suicides by hanging. These days, they're mostly only seen in countries where long drop hangings are still done to execute people. A long drop hanging will almost always break the neck, so much so that it can result in internal decapitation or a full-on decapitation. Prior to 1892, the drop was between four and 10 feet, about one to three meters, depending on the weight of the body. But they had some problems with this method. Namely, the problem was that people's heads were popping off their bodies. And while the town did really like to come out for a hanging, they were upset when there was an accidental decapitation. People were fainting all over the place. It was just too far, too much. What? You gotta keep those hanging nice and neat, you know, family friendly, so to say. Exactly. And so that's <laughs> why between 1892 and 1913, the length of the drop was shortened to specifically to avoid decapitation. But Rebecca's fall was measured to be 9.2 feet. So it's right in that three meter range. How was her neck not broken? In the oxygen special, Paul Hole says that the broken hyoid bone and cricoid cartilage looks a lot more like strangulation. Quote, for me, the the biggest thing in my mind that I really want to dig into further is the amount of damage to her neck. If this was a true long drop execution hanging, I would expect a lot more trauma, if not near decapitation, broken neck, internal decapitation, or full decapitation after this victim had dropped nine to 10 feet, end quote. And Cyril Wecht agreed. In his exam, he felt like her injuries were much more consistent with strangulation than with hanging. He says, quote, while I am not prepared to unequivocally with absolute scientific certainty say that it was a homicide and that it was not a suicide, I lean very strongly toward it being a homicide, something involving foul play, and I lean very strongly against it being a suicide, he said. Wecht also said that he was particularly troubled by findings in both autopsies that Rebecca had suffered blows to the top of her head, indicated by four separate hemorrhages below the scalp. Wecht said that such an injury pointed to the possibility that Rebecca was maybe knocked unconscious with a blunt object, and it could explain why police said there was no sign of a struggle at the scene. He said the way in which Sahau would have had to tie herself up was possible, but not implausible. He also questioned why, according to the autopsy report, sticky tape residue was found on her legs. Quote, where is the tape and what was it used for, Wecht asked. Let me give you two scenarios. One could say maybe she was going to bind her feet with duct tape and she switched to the rope. Well then, where's the duct tape, if that's the case? And the other scenario is maybe somebody else was attempting to put duct tape around her feet, or maybe did put duct tape around her feet when she was being subdued and then took it off. Those marks, clearly from tape like duct tape, where do they come from? Why are they there? End quote. Lividity is also brought up because her lividity is in her back, and people think it should be in her feet and in her legs if she was found hanging. Lividity is the almost bruise-like appearance of where blood settles when your heart stops beating. But in this case, if the time of death is correct, then when Adam allegedly found her and cut her down, there actually would have still been enough time for lividity to shift from her legs to her back while she was laying on her back on that lawn for over 12 hours. And so all of this information and all of these facts are coming up, and they're important because the Zahaus filed a civil suit, a wrongful death suit, against Adam. Initially, it was against Adam, Nina, and Dina, but eventually it was just Adam. So they ruled out the twins completely. Yeah, initially they thought they were all in on it together, and I think they thought that maybe the twins had sat on the bed, and that's why it didn't move very much. But they were able to show that Dina was in the hospital with Max and Jonah, and I think Nina was cleared by cell phone records. But they allege in their lawsuit that Adam incapacitated her, strangled her, assaulted her, then tied her up, and he had been watching Asian bondage porn, and that maybe she was hoisted rather than hung up. But either way, it definitely wasn't suicide. That could make sense that she was hoisted up. Whoever did it, though, wasn't too bothered by creating an authentic and plausible suicide look, to be fair. I know. Other problems with the suicide theory. Anne Bremner notes that she found it very odd that Rebecca's long hair was tucked under the noose and the t-shirt found wrapped around her neck was also over her hair. And I agree, this is really odd. We both have longer hair. Can you stand to have your hair under your neckline? It is 
the worst. I always hated having my hair stuck in coats or, you know, under shoulder bags and backpacks. So no, no way would a person with long hair put a noose over the hair. I agree. So yes, many of you might say, I mean, okay, but she was about to commit suicide. It just didn't matter to her anymore. But let me tell you, it does matter because this is an automated move you make when you have long hair. Yep. As you can tell, I agree. It's just, it's totally a reflex. You don't even think yeah. about it. And it's itchy. You know, like people joke about wearing a hair shirt. Like that's a joke because it's, it's not comfortable to have your hair touching your skin. Yeah. Bremner thinks this is an indication someone else may have tied that noose around her neck. And I agree. It's compelling. So, all right. Some of the other evidence, blood and a lack of it. So if the blood drops by the door are from when she was standing, writing a message on the door naked while she had her period, why aren't there more blood drops in the room itself? Especially if she was standing there tying her own hands and legs, which I would have thought would have taken longer than writing the message. And then when she did that, she'd have been hopping across the floor to get to the balcony, but there's no blood anywhere else on the floor or on the tile of the balcony. I don't know. To me, that just seemed really odd. We know from the autopsy she had her period, but if you're bleeding heavily enough to drip blood on the floor while painting a message, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario in which there isn't even one single other drop of blood somewhere between the door and her going headfirst over the balcony. <sighs> I'm unsure about that, to be honest, but just because of my personal experience. So first of all, did she use a tampon or a cup or what was her deal? And I also have to say, I think it would depend on the way she was standing and walking. Like if she was standing for a longer time in a position with her legs more apart while painting the note, then it would be possible that there would be a few drops only there while otherwise they would rather fall on her legs, you know, on her thighs. Yeah. Do I even make sense in the way I try yeah. to explain what I mean? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you do. No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. So she wasn't using anything as far as I know know in terms of feminine products which is why it's so weird that she was totally naked but there were small amounts of blood on her thighs noted in the autopsy so it's very possible you're right that once her feet was bound the blood drops just hit her thighs instead it's also worth noting that blood was found on all four sides of that smaller serrated knife's handle so it was determined to be menstrual blood and the Sahau family attorneys and I think the family believes that because blood was found on all four sides of the handle they thought it meant that the handle of the knife had been used to sexually assault her but the investigators believe that it was just blood on her hands while she held the knife cutting the rope. They did determine that they did not feel like there was a sexual assault because no semen was found and there was no injury at all to her vagina that would indicate sexual assault. So I think maybe they were right that she just got a little bit of blood on her hands and then got some blood transfer. Because if you look at photos uh, that we'll post, you can see the knife. It's definitely not covered in blood. You really can't even see any blood on it at all. Maybe just a hint of pink. But I don't think she was assaulted with the knife handle, although I realize that might just be wishful thinking. So who else testifies? Lindsay Philpot. He's a forensic engineer and a rope analyst, and he looks like a salty sea captain. He's got like a white beard and kind of like this. I can't tell if it's it's like a mullet ponytail situation, but it's white. <laughs> it sounds bad, but it's great. It really works for him. He appears in all kinds of things. You'll be able to see him in the videos and things I've posted. He's a um, forensic engineer and rope analyst, and he testifies in the civil case. And he also worked on the Jean Benet case. He says these are very, very complicated nautical knots. And he doesn't think that somebody without a lot of experience could tie these knots. And do you remember what Adam Shack and I did for a living? Yes, I do. He He's a boat captain. Yes. Uh, yeah. And yes, nautical knots are something that need a lot of training and it's not done accidentally. You know what I mean? Did you ever see the Nick? There's the main character, Dr. Thackeray, and he starts to learn uh, all the nautical knots to occupy his hands while he's fighting a heroin addiction. Because it takes a while to learn them properly. Yeah, that's the Clive Owen show, right? Yes, yeah, thank you for reminding me because I have meant to watch that for a few years now. Yeah, you're right. Rebecca occasionally tied up their boat 
but he says this is a lot more complicated than what you would do to tie up a boat and that it would be really hard to do behind your back. He says that when he looks at the photo of Rebecca's hands tied and he looks at the police reconstruction of her tying herself up, it's his opinion that they're not the same knot, that the binding on Rebecca was a lot more complicated, a clove hitch, but the police disagree and say it was not a fancy knot. And in the new oxygen special, we're, to we're also told that they're not that complex. So Billy Jensen goes to a shibari expert. That's a type of Japanese bondage where people are tied up with like fancy, beautiful knots and then suspended. The women that they meet with there, they say that it's a very basic knot and they show how you could just tie the knot, slip a hand out, you know, slip it back in like we talked before. And it, it just wasn't much trouble at all. So it's really hard to tell. I'm not sure for certain who's correct about the knots and how complicated they are. That's another thing I wish I could get clarification on. Like, are they absolutely complicated nautical knots or are they very simple basic knot? Because that would make a huge difference. You know what I mean? Maybe it's uh, it depends on the point of view. Maybe for a nautical expert, they look complicated because he sees nautical knots in them. And for a shibari expert, they're like, like everyday occurrences i don't know could be and what i still don't understand is why you tie your feet and why you do it naked like was she wandering around the house going into the garage to get the rope and she's just naked the whole time and on her period don't get me wrong i'm a european we wander around the house naked all the freaking time yeah but i would not <laughs> do that while i'm having my period without no. using a hygiene product on top yeah. of it Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's actually something that they bring up in that oxygen special. So, yep, you're thinking the same way they were. Who wanders around naked, not using anything when they have their period? It's weird. So, fingerprints were found on the other large knife found in the office guest room. They're Rebecca's, but they're on the blade. When they do a reconstruction, they show, like, how she'd have been holding the knife. And it's in a really weird way with her fingers and thumb all on the blade with the sharp edge pointed in toward her hand. So more like someone put her hand on the knife to get her prints on it, mm -hmm. but they didn't bother making sure her prints were actually in a place that made sense. I mean, it fits with the theme of somebody not knowing what they were doing and faking a suicide very badly. Also remind me again, for what did she supposedly need the knives? I know one she needed for cutting up the rope, but why did she have more than one knife? I don't know. I wonder if she got the first knife and was trying to cut the rope with it but because it was a straight edge knife not a mm -hmm. serrated edge so i wonder if she had to go back down and get a second knife we just don't know but then again wouldn't there have been blood just somewhere else it's just so strange to me that aspect of things but hey who knows Oh, another thing that was weird was that, and they talk about this in the Marsha Clark documentary that I watched. She's talking to Keith Greer, who was one of the Zahau attorneys. So he does this whole demonstration with the knife. And then he also talks about how that tube of paint that was used, it was Rebecca's paint. As we said, she was an artist. But the weird thing is only one fingerprint was found. And the fingerprint was found on the flat part of the cap. Imagine these tubes of paint. They kind of look like an oversized tube of toothpaste. Do you know what I mean? That sort of shape. It's like a tube that stands upright on its cap when the cap is closed, and that's how you would store it, and it's plastic. So in theory, this plastic tube should very easily have picked up fingerprints, but there were no prints anywhere except for on the cap. Why wouldn't her prints also be around it? Because you would have had to hold it and then press down with your thumb, which is what they found on the cap. But it's just weird. There's no other prints. Yeah, that doesn't make sense unless someone wiped the tube clean. Yeah. The paintbrushes also, they had no DNA or fingerprints on them. Okay, but they were her used paintbrushes. She was an artist holding these paintbrushes quite often. And you also hold them with your fingertips. There must be prints. I mean, you'd think so, right? But no, there's no foreign DNA found on the rope, the paintbrushes, or the knives found in the room, only Rebecca's. But then that's also weird, right? Because it's a common room that she's found in. You'd think someone else's prints would be found. And the only thing they really found was, I think, one tiny print of Max's somewhere else in the room. Yeah, so someone wiped things clean. Exactly. That's what people think. Interestingly, the knife that Adam said he used when he cut Rebecca down, and I don't know, I think that might be the grunting that you hear back in that 911 call. That knife he used to cut her down, it didn't have Adam's fingerprints or his DNA on it. So, you know, was he wearing gloves? Who wears gloves in, you know, San Diego County, California in the summertime? 
And then speaking of gloves, there was a pair of black gardening gloves found. I think they were found in the guest house with an indeterminate DNA mixture. So on the Dr. Phil show, Ann Bremner lays all of this new information out and she says, quote, we have mixed DNA in this case all over in things like the knife, the bed frame, the black gloves, mixed DNA unexplained as to who these other donors are. It's a case that just cries out for answers and investigation. We have mixed DNA in her fingernails, end quote. After that show aired, the DNA finding was debated during during a news conference held in response to the findings of the second autopsy. So the sheriff's crime lab director, Michael Grubb, he does like a press conference just because there's so much of a hubbub over the Dr. Phil show appearance. So sheriff's crime lab director, Michael Grubb says, quote, the majority of the DNA under Rebecca Zahau's fingernails was her own. Various fingernails were tested as separate samples, and one of them showed a DNA mixture, but the level of DNA was so low that it was an uninterpretable mixture. End quote. In addition to the fingernail sample, unidentified DNA was also recovered from the rope that was used in um, the hanging. It was also found on the large knife used to cut the rope, the bed frame to which the rope was tied, a doorknob on the balcony door, and a pair of black gloves found on a table, I think in the guest house, Grubb said. Quote, DNA can come to be on all sorts of surfaces, doorknobs, any public surface can gain DNA from a number of people, and it will reside there and may be picked up by someone else, said Grubb. When you have low-level mixture and it's so low that it's uninterpretable, it means that even if we have other subjects to compare, it's not going to be fruitful, end quote. So that makes sense. Because the amount of mixed DNA recovered was so minuscule, San Diego County Sheriff Bill Gore said that it was unnecessary to collect DNA samples from Jonah or Jonah's ex-wife, Dina. Ultimately, the San Diego medical examiner stands by the initial findings in the case and believes that Zahau died by suicide, but they do do another review of the case. So in December 2018, they have a press conference to go over the findings of this second review. During that press conference, Dr. Glenn Wagner says, quote, the evidence based on the abrasions, contusions throughout the body, to me, indicates that Rebecca went face first over the railing and impacted, slid down the wall, breaking the foliage, as well as leaving marks on the wall before the full length of that rope was reached and did, in fact, hang herself, end quote. So there's a long video and like a PowerPoint presentation that goes along with this, and I'll link to it so you guys can all see it. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. It is. You know what else is interesting? So Dr. Cyril Wecht did a second autopsy, and he said that he didn't think it could be conclusively ruled a suicide. But also Dr. Michael Bodden, another very famous forensic doctor, reviewed the entire case. And according to Ann Rule's book, he agrees with the San Diego County Sheriff's Office that this was a suicide. And how does he come to this conclusion? You know, I read about it in the Anne Rule book, and I actually did try to find some more information on it, but I couldn't find any more specifics. So in an interview with Rebecca's sister, they ask, what makes her believe this isn't a suicide? And she says, and I really, I wanted to have a quote from her family in this as well. So when asked why she believes it's not a suicide, her sister Mary says, quote, all of it, all of it doesn't fit. The conversation she and I had the day before, none of it adds up. She had two detailed plans for the next day, to take things for Jonah, to fix something for him to eat. She told me to tell our mom that she would call her on the way to the hospital in the morning, that she was going to text me throughout the day. I mean, that's somebody who's planning to kill themselves? End quote. The interviewer asks, could she have been depressed by the fact that Max was mortally injured while he was at home with her? She responds, quote, she did not feel responsible. She said it was a horrible accident. She said she doesn't know for sure what happened. She just remembered that he was playing in the hallway and she told me she was in the bathroom and she heard this loud crash. And so she came out running and she said she found Max on the floor unconscious. Yeah, and I guess there are people who say, well, she shouldn't have gone to the bathroom or wherever without having someone watch Max. But you know what? I think that's hypocritical because that's a six-year-old and we are talking about that he's in the safety of his own home and you, you can't and you shouldn't watch a six-year-old 24-7. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, listen, we know she had her period, so I'm guessing she just needed to use the bathroom. And in that five or 10 minutes, disaster struck. It's also just really hard because Dina Shackney is adamant that she and Jonah didn't know that Max's prognosis was terminal until after Rebecca's death. If that's true, then there's really no reason at all for her to have taken her own life. Okay, but what about the voicemail message? Didn't it inform Rebecca of Max's situation getting worse? 
Yes. So that's hard because Jonah and Dina, they have completely different accounts of when they heard that Max wouldn't make it. Honestly, it's not that surprising. I've been in that situation. I've been sleeping by myself in an ICU chair and been woken up in the middle of the night and been told pretty much the same that they heard that night, you know, that things had taken a turn and that person wasn't going to survive. It's awful. The funny thing about it is my memories are actually the clearest when I'm having flashbacks, which is such an odd, odd thing. I don't think there's any intentional subterfuge here. Like, I don't think that Jonah or Dina are trying to complicate the situation or they're lying about anything. I think they just honestly can't remember. But I'm guessing because we have the phone records that probably Jonah is right. Probably. The civil wrongful death trial began on Wednesday, February 28th, 2018. It was a jury trial. Six men and six women were on the jury. The plaintiff was the Zahau family, and they were represented by attorney Keith Greer. The defendant was Adam Shacknai, and he was represented by attorney Dan Webb. The jury didn't deliberate for very long, and in April 2018, they found Adam Shacknai guilty and awarded the Zahau family just over $5 million. Of all the evidence presented to the jury, attorney Keith Greer believed that a knife handle covered in Rebecca's menstrual blood convinced the jury that Rebecca was sexually assaulted. However, Adam Shacknai's defense attorney said in court that there was no evidence, no DNA, and no telltale fingerprints to show Adam Shacknai had any involvement in the incident. Two weeks after that decision, the sheriff's department reopened its investigation in the case in the spirit of transparency and open-mindedness, end quote. <laughs> Investigators concluded that the evidence did not support the jury's verdict. They said that wounds found on Zahau's forehead were more superficial than the type of serious, debilitating trauma described by the Zahau family lawyer during the trial, and nor was there any indication of sexual assault. Quote, after conducting this review, the case team found no evidence that would lead us to believe that Rebecca Zahau died at the hands of another. San Diego Sheriff Bill Gore told reporters, quote, in addition, we found no evidence that would dispute or be inconsistent with the finding that the manner of death was suicide, end quote. In February 2019, the case was settled for $600,000 paid by an insurance company covering Shacknai's legal expenses and legal exposure. So outside the courtroom, Adam Shacknai, who was not at all involved with the settlement, he maintains his innocence and told reporters that Zahau's family, quote, did this partially for the money, but partially so they did not have to show up in church and have people look at them and think, quote, our daughter committed suicide. Yeah, and I get that. That is indeed a huge problem for deeply religious people. And this family clearly is a very faithful Christian family. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of shame involved. Shacknai reminded people that law enforcement had ruled the woman's death a suicide, and he had some harsh words for the civil court system regarding the trial and the result. Initially, when, you know, he was first found guilty, he said, quote, it started out as a family matter, you're cleared by law enforcement, then all of a sudden a civil court comes up and you're five miles behind, and you're behind the eight ball because of not speaking out in the media beforehand and choosing to just stay out of it, which was not easy to do. Shacknai said. Yeah, so hopefully I've covered the bulk of the evidence and hopefully I've covered the arguments on both sides and I haven't left out anything important. Okay, you said your mind changed. What do you think now? Okay, so before I started this, I really, really, truly felt certain that she had been murdered. And obviously I wasn't alone. You know, even her boyfriend's ex-wife to this day still thinks she was murdered. But now, I'm honestly less sure. I think the most important piece of evidence, I don't know, I wish we could hear the message that was left from Jonah, that he left when he learned Max wouldn't make it. What did he say and how did he say it? Was he just consumed with grief? You know, you could even understand if he said something cruel in the heat of the moment. Some people speculate that he said, you know, pack all your shit and get out because I can't stand to look at you. I doubt very much that he did say anything even remotely like that, but I could see her deciding to end things. She just learned that a child she loved like her own was going to die while he was under her care, so clearly it was at least somewhat her fault, and now she's losing the man that she loved too. I don't think it's too far a stretch to say this could drive someone to take their own life. There's nothing that proves that anyone else was in the room with her, so I can I can really see that maybe she did do it, especially if there was an element of that saving face of an, of an Asian honor situation. And even if he broke the news gently, maybe hearing his pain was too much for her to handle. 
Yeah, exactly. I think she really, really did love him. I actually think as well that based on everything I've seen and read about him, I don't think he would have been cruel, but maybe just sounded devastated. And I can also see maybe trying to make your suicide look like a murder if you thought it would help your family cope. Do you know what I mean? I guess specifically what I mean by that is if you die by suicide, you may have family left saying, why didn't I know? How could they not have told me they were feeling this way? Why didn't I do something? You know, there's so much pain directed inward when a family loses somebody to suicide. And the family's just left feeling this sense of deep regret and kind of failure, like you failed this person that you loved. I know a lot of loved ones of suicide victims do feel responsible for not being able to prevent it, and they live with this twisted up knot of just grief and guilt forever. Whereas if you're murdered... There's still obviously terrible, terrible loss and pain, but now that pain is directed outward. Now you've got someone to direct that fury toward. You can say, someone did this to this person I love. You know, there's still pain. There's always more than enough pain to go around when you've lost someone suddenly, but now that pain is, you know, it's not, you're not hating yourself. You're hating someone else. You're angry at this third party who did this to that loved one. They're the reason that you're in so much pain. But what doesn't make sense to me, if you're going to take your own life and Asian honor is a part of that why would you do something that then left your naked body exposed to the public it just makes no sense at all because the shame of nudity would eclipse the regained honor you got from from taking your own life in the first place unless you thought that the key to making your family believe you'd been murdered was that nudity that's kind of the way I feel I think I think she probably did it, but there's issues like why wasn't there any more blood drops around the room unless she was carried, but then her footprints were on the balcony, and then why the weird cryptic writing on the door? Why wasn't her neck broken if it was an over nine foot drop? You know what I mean? Or did Jonah leave a perfectly loving, sad message, and then after he called Rebecca, who's a sleeper in the shower, he called his brother, and when his brother heard the news, he went into that unlocked back door to go and confront Rebecca about how she was responsible for his nephew dying and he ends up murdering her paints the door the art supplies are in view and he gets pain on his hands which transferred to her body as he pinched a nipple because that's what a lot of people think the um paint on her breast was from and then she was strangled to death and hung but nope i've gone from she was definitely murdered to i think she probably took her own life i think everyone was devastated by max's accident and everyone had support but Rebecca. Jonah and Dina had siblings and friends flying immediately, and Rebecca had sent her sister home and sent her dog to be boarded, and she was spending all of her time running around trying to support everyone else. I just think when she learned Max wouldn't recover, it just broke her. It shocked her, and nobody was there to support her. And I'm not blaming anybody for this. It was just an impossible situation, and everybody was doing the best they could. But there's a reason, you know, people are generally given catastrophic news in person. And I will say, if she did die by suicide, which I do feel is more likely, then I really feel terrible for um, for Adam, Shaq and I, and everyone else who loved her because they don't really know what happened, and I don't know that they'll ever find peace with it. That was a lot of talking. Please tell me, what do you think? I do think, though, they should change that manner of death, though. I think they could still change the manner of death from suicide to undetermined, mm -hmm. even though I think it was a suicide. I think there's enough weirdness to change the cause of death to, ha by, to hanging and the manner of death undetermined. Well, I think this is such a complex case and it's super hard for me to really form an opinion. I think you summed it all up perfectly. The voice message definitely would have been a key clue as to what had happened. And I totally get that the situation could bring it to a point where you want to end your life. I have a few thoughts. I don't know if she committed suicide or if she was murdered, but I do have some thoughts upon things that other people apparently have issues with. Because um, since we started this last week, I was thinking a lot about it. Firstly, about the 911 call by Adam. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people say he sounds like he's distancing himself and he sounds weird and unemotional. I feel bad for the guy because to me, he sounds like he's in distress because I'm this kind of unemotional person who maybe would sound like this you know like he says got a girl hung herself mm -hmm. like he would be thinking if i tell the operator rebecca hung herself or my brother's girlfriend hung herself. that's not important information and maybe he's 
the kind of guy who just works like this, you know, just get the information out there and, and tell them what they need to know. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, my husband would say about me, you know, why use three words when 42 or so much better? But <laughs> there are lots of people who would. You're absolutely right. Yeah. That's a really good point. About the menstrual blood, I think I said already everything I have to say. I don't I don't see an issue with her not dropping blood everywhere, to be honest. And maybe, yeah. I mean, do we even know if she walked around naked or maybe she just undressed when everything was set up? No, that's true. We don't. We don't know. Because we have that in our head. Okay, she was walking around fixing everything, but that's not necessarily what happened. Well, she and was definitely naked painting the door because we've yeah, got the exactly. drops there. Yeah, exactly. But if and that then... was the last thing she did, like, why would she have gone to the garage naked? We don't know true. if she did that. Yeah. No, that's true. Absolutely. Yep. And I think Well, she... I think, sorry, I do think this, so the sh one thing I didn't say is what the sheriff's department in their, one of their press releases said was they believe that she took a shower, came out of the shower, and then never got dressed and, and, and killed herself, as yeah. I think the, what they had said. So I think that's why there was so much like, what was she just wandering all over the place yeah. naked? Like, you know, yeah. And I mean, she seemed to be rather rational about the way she handled things. Like she took care of her dog, you know, she mm -hmm. made sure he's taken care of. I'm not saying that she planned all this beforehand, but maybe it was, I want to say easier, but it was like, you know, she knew, okay, my dog is taken care of. There are these devastating news and uh, I can't handle this like this and I need to do that. Well, maybe it's but possible. It's really, really hard to say. It's really, I, it's hard. I what can understand gonna... that she wanted to make it look like a murder, not like a suicide. But then on the other hand, I mean, it would have been nice to also not do it in a way that incriminates your boyfriend's family, maybe. There are easier ways to do that and, and more plausible. And it's all just very mysterious that the message she left, it's unsettling. It's very unsettling. It really is. It's just such a complicated case. But I really did believe that it was a murder. And now I'm pretty sure that, unfortunately, I think she did. Um, but it's one of those things where if they find, like, one more piece of evidence, you know what I mean? Or if they find a, I don't know, could it have been someone not related to the family? Like, she was mm. a beautiful girl. So it's mm. possible that someone noticed her and watched her and who knows. But I, I just, I have to agree with the police here. I think that all the evidence, what we have in terms of evidence, no matter how things actually look, the evidence really does support that, tragically, she seems to have ended things herself. People have done it for, for less. Definitely. Yeah. It's just heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And both of these deaths were just terrible losses because Max was a beautiful, beautiful child who I'm sure would have grown up to do great things. And Rebecca really seems to have been a lovely, loving, kind person. You know, her life was taken far too soon, whatever the reason. So, yeah. Let us know what you think, please. I'm curious. And uh, Johanna, please, would you tell me something good? Because we talked about it before, or I mentioned it briefly, uh, go watch The Nick. It's an amazing two-season show. It stars Clive Owen. It's... Mm, I love Clive Owen. Uh, yeah, I, I have him tattooed on my leg, so... <laughs> Well, I have no. Do yeah, Doctor. Yeah, Doctor Thackeray from the Nick. I love <sighs> that show. It's perfect. You need to send me a picture. I don't remember <laughs> if I've seen that one. I need another picture of your owl tattoo too. That one's my favorite. <laughs> it's the They're twin peaks. Yeah. 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 Go watch it. It's really, really, really good. The soundtrack is amazing. They have like this electronic soundtrack, and but it somehow fits. Although it's set, it's set in the early 20th century, and it's about the the Nick, the hospital in New York about the early days of surgical doctors and surgeries yeah. they did. And yeah, it's amazing. I can't wait. I'm going to watch it. I promise you. It's, Do thank it. you for reminding me. It really, it really has been on my to-watch list for forever. Mine this week is I mentioned Paul Holes and Billy Jensen several times uh, during this uh, episode, and they have their own podcast. It's called Jensen and Holes, The Murder Squad, and on it, they utilize uh, listeners to help solve cold cases. It's really fascinating. It's really well done. It's on the Exactly Right Network, which is, of course, the network started by Karen Kilgareth and Georgia Hardstark of My Favorite Murder which is also one of my favorite podcasts. And I would also like to recommend Michelle McNamara's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. If you hadn't read it yet, you should. 
It's on my list. I'm reading now the John Douglas book, but it's going to be the next. I oh, read. yeah. Who Fights Monsters. Mm-hmm. Who, he, who, yeah. that Yeah. So good. So good. Those are our recommendations this week, everyone. And we really appreciate you listening. Please, please do us a huge favor. If you like our show, take a moment to review us. It really helps us a lot. Join the Facebook group. Leave a comment. Go to iTunes if you use that. And yeah, if you like us, give us five stars, please. Please. We're, we're begging. We're not. <laughs> We're not proud people. So, but listen, um, again, we talked a lot about suicide again today. And so we just really want to reiterate that if you're in a bad place yourself, uh, if you need some help, just please remember that you're not alone. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-TALK. If you're a veteran, you can text 838-255. In Austria, you can dial 142 to reach the Telefonseelsorge, and they are there 24-7. So if you're yeah. really... If you're in need of somebody to listen to you, call there. And if you're in any other country, go to www.iasp.info and there you find a list of all crisis hotlines for 77 different countries. Exactly. And we're going to post links to more resources on our page because uh, you matter to us and we really want you to stick around. So please, please, if you are going through hell, keep going. You can do it. We'll see you next week. Tschüss. Bye.